welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with Shuko. My name is Ruth Slavid and I'm your host for the webinar. And the subject today is Beyond the Classroom, Keeping Children Engaged, Healthy and Safe. There'll be lots of opportunities for question and answer at the end, but I suggest if a question does occur to you while somebody's speaking, that you pop it into the question box and then we will consider them all at the end of the event and get our speakers to answer them. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Shuko's UK Commercial Director, Sean Butler. Welcome to the first of our 80 Shuko New Perspectives webinars, which will be exploring the themes of long life, loose fit, sustainable construction, designing safer buildings and health and wellbeing over the course of 2021. In our first webinar, we will hear from three experts who will offer practical advice for designing the school of the future and how to keep children engaged, healthy and safe. As part of our discussions, we will focus on health and well-being and the importance of open air and ventilation in the school. This is an area where we believe we have some expertise in at Shuko. As a company, we're often asked for advice on school renovations, particularly those built in the 60s and 70s, and many of which feature large single glazed windows that are reaching the end of their life. These windows are often responsible for making classrooms too hot in summer, too cold in winter, and very expensive to heat. Nowadays, window systems can provide high levels of natural ventilation, be extremely thermally efficient, and incorporate passive or active ventilation to ensure that there is always outside air entering the classroom, even when the windows are closed. However, this webinar will go far beyond potential solutions for energy and inefficient windows and doors in the classroom to consider the impact of other new and emerging technologies, the widespread adoption of digital learning and recent research on different approaches to school design. I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentations and discussions today. Thank you once again for joining us and I'll now pass you back to Ruth who is chairing today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Now we're moving on to the first of our three speakers who all of them are going to be looking at education and the way it's changing from very different angles. Obviously a subject that we've all been engaging with. I'm sure a lot of you have been dying to have a relationship with any sort of classroom at all at the moment. We're starting with Diana Fletcher, who is Studio Director at ADP Architecture, um, and she'll be looking at some different approaches to school design. Diana. Thank you. I'm delighted to be speaking to, to you today about our research into looking at designing for well-being in education. Over the last few years, there's been an increasing discussion in the media about the issue of mental health and a growing openness about discussing it. As architects who work extensively in the education sector, we were very keen to understand more about this. And over the last couple of years, we've been researching this, talking to our clients and undertaking surveys with clients. So there's no health without mental health, something you've probably heard before. Um, there are some fairly stark statistics. Um, you're probably familiar with the one in four of us will suffer from mental illness at some point in our lifetime. The even more worrying stats are when you look at the prevalence of mental illness in children and young people. Um, by 24, 75% of mental health issues are already established. But in fact, we all have mental health, just as we all have physical health. And of course, it varies day to day. So physical health can vary between, um, you know, maybe we're feeling a little bit overweight, a bit unfit and mental health varies. So our researchers, rather than looking at diagnosable mental health issues, we were looking at the everyday well-being of staff and students and how we could support that um, within our designs. There's, um, I mean, it's the, the WHO has had a shift away from a wider understanding of health as rather than focusing on ill health, the definition and study of well-being has been emphasising the behaviours that support a flourishing population. And of course, in the last year, I think it's probably become even more obvious to us the importance of our mental health. So schools and the social values schools provide have become really very clear to us all. Um, they provide a lot of emotional support and routine for 
um, for the children that go there and, and for the staff. So these were just a few headlines that I sort of cropped off uh, the internet over the last couple of days. And there's been you know a lot in the press over, uh, recently about the impact on children um, during lockdown, the lack of access to their friends, the lack of the structure of school. And, you know, and the government quite rightly are very keen to get children back to school as soon as possible. So how do we look after our mental well-being? So there are uh, many different ways and studies looking at this. If you do some research online, there's lots of authorities such as the UK Green Building Council, Nuffield Health, and lots of scientific studies looking into this. But the one that particularly resonated with us was the five ways to well-being. This was um, a key set of anchors uh, established in about 2008 by the NEF as part of a government project. So they are useful anchors for a more complex set of def definitions and they've been used by lots of individuals since then um, and groups, churches, GPs, etc. Um, so the five ways to well-being are connect, connection to other people and the places we live and work, being active, so keeping moving, keeping fit, sport, incidental movement, taking notice, so often referred to as mindfulness or being in the moment, observing our surroundings, keep learning, so keep learning throughout your lifetime, um, keep learning music and the arts. And of course, this is particularly relevant to um, those of us later in life um, because pupils are necessarily learning. And then the last is giving. So research suggests that helping others is good for us as individuals. It gives us a sense of well, uh, well-being and purpose. And of course, during the current closure of schools and lockdown for children, this has restricted their access to almost all of those five ways. So how do we take those and use them in a design setting? Um, Social psychologists define changing behaviours as downstream and upstream. So downstream focuses on individual interventions, but upstream, by contrast, focuses on changing the environment in which behaviour occurs and promoting alternatives. So we can, with design-led interventions, we can use sort of what we call nudge uh, architecture, nudge psychology. So nudging people into better behaviours by making certain behaviours a little bit more difficult and other choices, better choices, easier. So we've taken those five ways to well-being and we've twisted them into sort of design activities. So connect becomes places to connect, be active is designing spaces that encourage activity, take notice is things to take notice of, keep learning, designing spaces for learning, and give is creating an environment for giving for altruistic behaviour. Um, the five ways to well-being in the physical or sort of mindful estate are the goals or behaviours that we're trying to target. So we found it quite helpful to approach them in a fairly straightforward way within a set list of means. So aspects of design that we all understand and can form a useful checklist. So light and sunlight, comfort, control, biophilic design, aesthetics, layout, sustainability and safety and accessibility. So looking at some of the ways that which we can do that. So it's providing uh, social learning spaces perhaps an on-site cafe, um, en route social spaces and benches that aren't too, spaces that don't have prescribed use, that have adaptability, benches along routes, high quality green space that can be used. I mean, that's long acknowledged to bring health benefits. Inside um, the layout of offices for staff to feel supported and locations for staff to go and have a contemplative moment. And within all of these, making sure that we bring um, the outside in, we use biophilic design. So perhaps providing an area to meet shelter amongst foliage, perhaps an indoor pergola, seating areas um, uh, under tall trees, etc. Encouraging activity. So this is really looking at activity that's outside of 
programmed activity so outside of organized sport organized PE so it's really trying to encourage everyday activity so looking at attractive circulation routes and staircases making staircases really welcoming so you've got views along the way daylight at the end um, rewarding that that activity corridors with artwork along them um, provision of good exercise space secure cycle storage activity-based learning and then um, nature trails and wildlife pathways and play decks so all sorts of different ways to really try and encourage um, that activity through the day to keep people moving keep people walking not taking the, the sort of easy option of the lift for example then moving on to things to take notice of so various studies have established that complex facades um, are actually affect people in a positive way and negatively if they're simple and monotonous so some of the examples we're showing there of um, the artwork on the school at the top that children have contributed to designing but provide a really rich um, environment to look at highlighting if a site has interesting historic buildings and features making the most of those providing horizons so looking towards landscape features looking across a space giving a sense of perspective access to nature, landscaping, wildlife features. Um, so one of the things that's sort of quite interesting in this is the, the layout and shape of spaces. So there have been studies that show that curved forms are perceived as more pleasant. Um, one study found that most people feel better in rooms with curved edges and rounded contours than in a sharp uh, angled rectangular room. Although it's sort of quite interesting that design students among the participants actually would prefer the opposite. So that might be quite telling. Um, th there's also, I think, those moments of delight that you get in a building. So the shaft of sunlight um, to a recessed window seat that creates a moment of warmth and calm. Interesting tactile materials that one can touch. Um, and I, a successful piece of architecture is one where there's an accumulation of many moments of delight that all support these five ways of well-being and I think sort of through all of these biophilic design actually is the one that I think is the most important that is repeated and helps deliver all all of the five ways of well-being moving on to spaces for learning obviously key in an educational environment so it's really looking at spaces that support um, learning in the most um, positive way so there is evidence that learning will improve when comparing a poor environment so that is a rundown poorly maintained space with an adequate one so one that is just good enough but actually that further and more extravagant facilities, so for example, providing really specialized spaces or digital equipment, equipment, actually doesn't show further improvements in learning. So it's really about making sure that we get the basics right. It's really important to encourage keep learning behaviors to provide quiet, calm spaces for reading and studying, creating separate spaces for noise creating activities, looking at ceiling height so low ceiling spaces are better at focus tasks such as studying or reading whereas more generous spaces prime us to feel free which tends to lead people to engage in more abstract styles of thinking they're better able to see a wider perspective and see what aspects are in common particularly appropriate for social gathering spaces for example so that all ties in with the acoustics of a space so as one progresses through a school and actually an echoey hallway and stairwell can signal where people are gathering. A carpeted corridor dampens the noise to the classroom and soft furnishing and bedding creates a tranquil environment for sleep. So all these things sort of come together to create great spaces for learning. Um, and just looking at the bullet points, um, you know, bring, again, the biophilic using outdoor spaces, dipping ponds, bug hotels, using, I think, part of the pandemic actually um, when schools went back last year 
the use of outdoor spaces for teaching became much more popular. So because of the, the social distancing that was needed. So actually providing spaces outside for learning, outdoor auditoriums, sheltered spaces. And you can see in the top image here, this is a, a sort of a play area outside, but is sheltered. So that can be used for play in inclement weather, but also as a learning space. Um, environment for giving. So I think this is probably the most difficult of the five ways to well-being to take through into design. It's very difficult to observe altruism and its sort of explicit relationship to design parameters, but there have been studies um, that show, sorry, let me just mute. There have been studies that show self-reported altruistic behavior is more prevalent in neighborhoods that incorporate positive environmental and physical characteristics of space design. So trying to create settings for pro-social rather than self-centered behaviors. So how might that sort of trans uh, be used in a school environment? So perhaps creating school allotments, connection to the food that's eating, um, looking at, uh, you know, gardens that children can get involved in, including staff and student in the design of their environment so that they feel very involved and making sure that um, they understand where how the building has been designed to be sustainable. Children are very interested in sustainability and, and you know, with, with the issues of, the cl of climate change. Um, what might this look like? This is a school that we're just about to start on site with. It's a sixth form centre for a school in Surrey. And looking at how we've sort of tackled those various five ways to wellbeing in this design. So the spaces for learning, making sure that we've got excellent acoustic design, good day, bringing daylight into lecture theatres, which maybe isn't so common, but that can be blacked out when needed, but actually gives people that connection to the external environment, brings daylight in, the space has good thermal comfort and um, teaching all is arranged to enable developing pedagogy. So flexibility in the way that teachers teach. Um, we've also included spaces for music and art, spaces that perhaps can be used for a yoga class or different, different ways different flexibilities that um, can be used for all sorts of different learning activities. Then encouraging activity, so attractive experiences along the circulation routes, making sure corridors have windows at the end, they're not dark and gloomy. Staircases are really attractive going up towards the light, they have views out. Um, then looking on things to take notice of. This is actually in the environment of a Victorian school. So although it's contemporary design, the facades respond to that historic environment and actually have uh, some depth and richness to the, the elevations that um, help stimulate that interest. Also access to nature, landscaping, wildlife features and windows that frame views. So it's very important to be able to look up and get a distant uh, view. Great light and airy spaces and actually spaces for art to be included. Um, places to connect. So we have a cafe in the sixth form that gives students an alternative to the main dining hall and actually creates as brings sort of a bit more of the outside environment into the school, a bit more of the, the wider world um, and preparing them for moving on to university. So my very not quite my very last slide, actually. Um, so this is all great, well and good, but actually how do we know it's having any impact at all on the students and staff that we that will be using these buildings? So alongside the five ways to wellbeing, one of the other um, studies we've been looking at is a way of measuring the impact of our designs through the design life of a project. So we've in the last year just launched our sustainability uh, SBE tool toolkit which is around the three our sort of three values core values of sustainability belonging and engagement 
And this is a tool that we use, we're going to be using and have started at feasibility stage, planning, construction, and then post occupancy evaluation. So you can see on that wheel, there are quite a number of different um, themes that we're looking at in order to measure the design uh, and impact of the building. And the, the sort of the blue and the purple wedges of the diagram are particularly that which is a belonging engagement are particularly the ones that overlap really well with the five ways to well-being so measuring place making and value community connectivity to nature connection and collaboration health outcomes emotional value lifestyle etc so that's a way that as we use this more and more we'll be able to build up some metrics in terms of how our designs are actually positively impacting and particularly obviously when we go back to buildings um, once they're in use and do the post-occupancy evaluation. And then the last slide is just a matrix that sets out those five ways to well-being against the various means, light, sunlight, biophilic design, etc. Really is just a useful checklist to go through um, when one's designing and see actually have we taken into account everything that we can, have we made the most opportunity um, taking the most opportunity in the designs that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. It was fascinating to see so much detailed research. Just a reminder to all of you that if you do have a question, hit the button and submit it, and we will be pulling questions out after the last of the three presentations. And we're now moving on to our next presenter, who is Hugh Gatenbury, who is founder of ArcEdge. And he is an architect who has very much moved into the area of education and education provision. Hugh. It's long been pointed out that a Victorian school teacher could have fallen asleep in his or her classroom and woken up 150 years later and found that little has changed. And that's a quotation from Rohan Silver earlier this year in the Times. And his article goes on to have a section subheaded, Let Tech Teach, in which he promotes students using digital resources to cover the content of the curriculum. But I remain unconvinced, despite the fact that I'm going to talk a lot about technology today. And I've put this still up from the film Fifth Element because it's got flying cars, which is a slightly odd way to start the architecture presentation. But I feel that visions of the future often see technology transforming how we do things. In this case, personal mobility, how we get from A to B, uh, which was once by ground and is now by air. And I think the car is an interesting example because technology's part in its story wasn't a transformation but an evolution we still have cars still have four wheels and still drive but the means of their power the means of their motion has changed from two stroke to four stroke and onto electric and i'm sure that technology will have an evolutionary role for education too rather than a transformative one and i think that because i'm recollecting my time at school and, and remembering the power of connections to great people, to great peers and to great teachers. And this isn't a photo of me. Uh, there were colour photos when <laughs> I was at, at school age. But even for the most tech enthusiastic and tech able students, I still think it's about great people. And the photo is of Bill Gates and Paul Allen and what center stage is their friendship, and they would go on together to co-found Microsoft. And I think what's really important to remember is that people can't really be replaced and technology can't supersede that, but I do believe it has a part to play. And that's because if we're talking about education as connection with people, Technology can connect us with people in new and exciting ways that have never been possible before and transcend space and borders. So my vision of education is people centric, but it's technology enhanced. And I want to continue to explore this vision of education, but in relation to 
some architectural questions because that's the, uh, the agenda of today really uh, and what I want to talk to you about particularly. And the first of those, the high level is site. Where is it that learning will be taking place? And I believe that, that learning will be taking place in schools. And that's complicated, I suppose, by the fact that I've spoken about technology and technology connecting. Because if technology can connect anyone anywhere, why be in the same place at all? And this is an image of an idea I had for some playground installations that would allow students to make friends with other students, other children across the world. But I've also shown the students in a school together. And as an architect, perhaps I would say this, but I think it is very important to share places with people. Um, and that's why I refute the counter suggestions that I've heard many times that technology enabled learning can happen in bedrooms, in bathrooms or in white boxes. And this is a school in Melbourne, Australia, a BYOP school, a bring your own plant school. And I think when you share a place with people, you, you rely on each other for the upkeep of that place, um, its atmosphere and its culture and to promote each other out in the wider community. And it's as you come to rely on each other that you create a network of support. And we've seen over the last year what happens when students are taken out of that network of support, out of the places that allow it. And the charity Young Minds have reported that 80% of young people have said their mental health has been worsened by the pandemic and by school closures. So I believe that schools will be the site, will be centre stage of learning still. But I also believe that schools across the country will connect. And to understand that, I'd like to explore how we compose class groups today. The class group that you or I probably sat with were based along lines of age, which is an okay uh, metric for organizing education. Um, and the fact that uh, your classmates were your neighbors. And I think that this is a much weaker um, <coughs> criteria for organizing classes. Um, you know, we don't share the same path of learning with people just because they're from the same catchment area or happen to live near us. We excel at different subjects and we try and take that into account in the way that we school our children with setting and streaming. But within those subjects, we might struggle with different topics. Um, we take the example of learning about China. You know, the, um, I might be excellent at understanding the theoretical frameworks of the, of the state controlled economy, but very bad at grasping the numbers. Um, and the competencies that I might need or someone even struggling with the same topic as me to overcome those issues in our education might be very different. And those competencies, learning those competencies will also need attention to our particular learning needs and requirements. And 15% of the UK's school population have SEN or special educational needs and that number continues to grow year on year. So I think we need to move away from a what Sir Anthony Selden calls a factory model of learning. And he ties the, the blossoming of this form of learning with the industrial revolution, where students sort of move along a production line, they're all treated the same, uh, and it happens at a consistent rate, and towards more personalization. And I've got an image here of, of archetypal factory learning. Everyone's drawing this leaf, um, exactly the same leaf, and they've even managed to get them all at exactly the same stage. And I would propose something different and, and this is an image of mine imagining an after lesson catch up where the students here are grouped together based on their like mindedness irrespective of where they live. In fact, half of these students are in Asia and half are in Europe. And why should that matter in the digital age when we can connect with people everywhere? And the technology for this isn't even unfamiliar in schools. It's not that radical. The virtual peers are here by virtue of an overhead projector. And the other students in this space are being boomed to the other school with image and sound capture, cameras and microphones, all these things you know you find in schools up and down the country. And as we start to explore the implications of connecting learners by compatibility, we're moving from architectural questions of site into architectural questions of space. What are the environments? 
in which this learning is 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 going to happen and what will they look like what would they be and i think that we'll move beyond the 30 person classroom and there's actually 32 students on the screen but you can see they're in a, a sir anthony selden style factory learning setup um, all of them you know in these nice rows of desks inside of one shared classroom which is the dotted line but what if we took those 32 students and organized them into smaller groups of compatible learners and those groups connected with other compatible groups in other schools and then in this model of learning everyone can achieve their individual potential and being an individual or being individual at school will no longer hold you back and the teacher that will lead this like-minded class of 32 students could be from any of those schools or perhaps from a different one that would just be the most relevant teacher for those learners. And as learning moves from larger groups to smaller groups, I'm looking at some of the work and research of, of Hermann Hertzberger, amazing architect and, and architect of education. And this diagram shows his idea of the standard classroom moving to an articulated classroom that's broken up to allow for smaller groups to become the norm in the learning experience in school. And this is his plan, the Montessori School in Delft, which is a superb architectural plan. And you can see how his classrooms are stepping into small nooks to allow for breakout learning. But it's still the repetition of 30 person classroom spaces. And I believe that with technology, we can move beyond this. But we've still got a long way to go. And this is HMM's 2016 Sterling Prize winning school, which is a fantastic scheme, but you can see how in education design, the number three here, the classroom, the standard classroom is ubiquitous and repeated. And in my opinion, the school of the future will be something more like a cell. And there will be specific specialized sites, tiny sites of individual personalized learning but it will all be held within this one function this this one cell this shared purpose the common goal of the school the shared school which we touched upon at the beginning and the power of that in creating a network of support and all of these little tiny sites of specialized and personalized learning will be held together in a cytoplasm matrix um, of social space that really allows for that community to flourish. And if that's a sort of rather strange, <laughs> uh, sort of abstract description of a school, I think some of that, those cellular metaphors are starting to be translated into plans in by some of the great architects of today. And Selgas Kano are looking at really cellular de design, and this is their second home at Holland Park. And you can see a, a cytoplasm social space matrix with small, um, you know, uh, working areas. And when I, we couple this with technology, I'm sure that we can have a very exciting new vision for connecting working being for education. And I think I'm just going to stick with co-working for a moment. I think it has other lessons for us. And this is a we work in Washington, DC. And I think it's important because new ways of doing things, in this case, a drop in, drop out, working culture go with the spatial configuration uh, the openness of this office that encourages people to come and go and that goes in hand with a construction in this case the frame curtain wall skyscraper which with large spans allows for that kind of open spatial configuration which goes hand in hand with the technology in this case portable electronics that allow people to vacate their desk completely and someone else to move into their place and we've spoken about a new way of educating and a new spatial configuration that would go with that connected form of learning. But I want to put the last two pieces in that puzzle with a technology and a construction technology. And I start with technology because I think over the last year, we've all experienced the inadequacies of Zoom one of the problems you might perhaps be seeing right now which is that you can only see my head from a webcam which means that all of my body language and all the com communicative cues that come with that are lost one of the other problems with zoom is that you can't see the 
other participants when that speaker holds the center screen. Um, and that, that person holding the center screen is only one person at a time. And if more than one person tries to speak at a time on Zoom, it, it descends into chaos, as I'm sure we've all experienced in home life or in work life. And in my vision of connected learning, I've been a bit more ambitious with the technology, and this is one of my ideas for a primary school. And the virtual peers, the virtual friends, are actually inhabiting the room with the, the kids who are in the school. And that allows for a much more natural form of interaction than would be possible on Zoom. And it might seem uh, far-fetched again. It might seem like I'm sort of asking you to believe that a little bit like Star Wars, blue people are gonna shimmer up out of the ground, but it, it really isn't such a remote possibility. In fact, the technology is called collaborative augmented reality, and it, it does exist. And you can see here, this is a still from a company called Spatial uh, showing their products. And the woman on the right has a virtual colleague inhabiting her studio space. And Spatial are a startup, so this technology is only going to get better and only going to get cheaper. But they've already announced contracts with Nestle and Mattel, and it is being used in the workplace. And in light of everything that's happened in the last year, they've had a lot of interest. And they say that 25% of the Fortune 1000 have expressed an interest in their services. And I think that collaborative augmented reality could allow for connecting an education to not be a compromise on just interacting with people from the immediate vicinity. And here's another still from spatial technology showing a larger group. And I think we'd move away from VR goggles. I, I much prefer the projections that I'm using, but we're moving towards a whole new world of, of connecting and interacting from what we've been subjected to in the last uh, 365 days or so. And I now want to talk about a construction technology to go along with the, the hardware software technology. And I guess this will be the final piece in the architectural story of, of site, space and construction. And I'm going to be talking to you about 3D printing. And 3D printing, I think, is going to be really interesting and really important. Uh, and I think it's particularly relevant today because I've spoken about plans that are articulated, plans with ranges of scales, plans that are essentially more complex. And complexity in construction means cost. But it doesn't with 3D printing. You can see that these students in EHD Zurich who 3D printed these columns have not been worried about complexity at all. The limitations have been the material and computational design. With 3D printing, you pay for the setup and the volume of the material, but not the complexity. However, these are 3D printed in concrete. So that's an old material with a new technique. And I think we need to move beyond this. I'm talking about education for future generations. So there's no point using materials that will mean that the world isn't there and preserved for those future generations, which is why I was really excited to see experiments in Italy with the WASP printer in 3D printing in Earth. And Earth is a fantastically sustainable material, infinitely recyclable, and you can dig it up on site and use it zero kilometers without any further transportation cost to the environment. And so I began to imagine schools 3D printed in Earth, and you can see the boom set up on the left-hand side of the image. And one of the things that I really like about Earth is that it actually varies enormously depending on where you are from deep reds through to blacks and, and browns and everything else and um, I have an image if you're digging up this earth on site and printing these schools and then they're connecting students linking up with other places if they're seen in the context of the space they're in that space will begin to sort of celebrate the local identity that they're bringing to those conversations be they national maybe even international but most of all I think that 3D printing as a construction technology will allow us to achieve spatial configurations that are articulated. And when coupled with collaborative augmented reality technology, we can have a new richer vision of education, which in my opinion, seems all the more relevant now. And to conclude, I wanna come back to lockdown, which I think will frame a lot of the conversation today. And I think one of the bleakest things 
has been seeing students' horizons shrink right down to their flat, their bedroom. And I'd like to just finish with a map that I created of all the primary school students in London. And each colour is a different first language that they speak. And London actually isn't the most linguistically diverse school population in the UK. And I think what it encapsulates for me is the extraordinary breadth of young people that we have in this country. And it's my hope that when students return back to school, when it's safe for them to do so, that we can expand their horizons as far as possible with a new connected form of learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. There were some really radical ideas there, uh, some really fresh thinking. I think you've given us all a lot to think about. And I just say to everybody, if that stimulated a question in your mind, do please press the question button because we will be taking the questions after our final speaker. Which brings me on to introducing that speaker, who is Jonathan Hines, Managing Director of Archetype, uh, a practice which has become very expert in Passive House. And we're going to be looking at the application to schools and particularly in the aftermath. I hope we're nearly in the aftermath of COVID-19. OK, thanks very much. It's very nice to be here today. So I'm going to be talking about designing schools uh, to Passive House and sort of the impact of COVID uh, in that uh, context. So just by way of introduction, uh, Archetype um, uh, has got a huge uh, range and experience of delivering passive house projects around the UK, uh, education buildings, archive buildings, housing and higher education other projects. But obviously today I'm specifically talking about uh, education school buildings. So just to put passive house in context, uh, the reason we uh, adopted passive house many, many years ago was because of our concern about the performance gap uh, in uh, new buildings. So just to give a sort of indication of how big that gap can be, uh, this is the energy prediction uh, in an S-band calculation for a non a normal non passive house building, and this is its actual consumption, so almost five times higher than predicted, which is a scandal, I, I think. Uh, so by contrast, this is the predicted energy for one of our passive house uh, buildings, and this is the actual uh, energy. Uh, and the client there at the University of Anglia is saying this is the only building we've ever had which performs exactly as it should. Now, in my book, every building, every client should expect every building to perform as it should. Uh, uh, and it's a scandal that it doesn't. And this is really what Passive House does. It does deliver what's required. There's also an energy, uh, as well as the energy performance gap, there's a gap in terms of comfort. So many, many traditionally built uh, modern buildings are actually pretty uncomfortable to occupy because there, there are drafts caused by sort of background amount of ventilation. There's, uh, cold radiation from cold surfaces on single double gaze windows uh, and that leads to sort of poor stratification uh, in the air and discomfort uh, and by contrast the passive house building by uh, reducing uh, eliminating uh, the sort of cold spots caused by thermal bridging uh, and by uh, having constant background me mechanical ventilation you get a, a very very good level of comfort guaranteed uh, by design. So what, what is uh, passive house then? Well, first of all, it is a rigorous comfort standard. It guarantees that you get a comfortable even temperature throughout the building and throughout the day. Uh, it ensures a constant supply of fresh air, which I'll come back to in the context of COVID, and it uh, prevents uh, overheating. So it's really guaranteeing that the internal comfort will be as expected. It's then a rigorous energy standard. It sets a, a thermal energy limit of 15 kilowatt hours square meter per year and a total primary energy limit 135. Uh, that that uh, is a significant reduction in energy and you can't just say you're achieving that, you have to prove it using the PHPP, the Passive House Planning Package uh, software. To give you an idea about the difference in consumption, this is the actual thermal energy consumption in 10 uh, non-Passive House schools in a large local authority. And over on the right hand side, you can see monitored data from six of our Passive House uh, school buildings. So almost a 90% reduction in uh, energy required to heat all the, the, the buildings. And if you looked at overall energy, including electricity, you'd be uh, reaching about a 70% reduction. So a significant uh, reduction. Passive House is then a rigorous quality assurance standard. 
Uh, there's an external certification check that the design complies with the standard. And then uh, there's a requirement to provide evidence that the construction is actually built to that standard with a very tough air test, supply commissioning data and evidence that you've installed all the right uh, components. So it's that quality standard which ensures that the comfort and energy is actually met. And it's all uh, basically uh, based on evidence. Uh, it's based on the rules of building physics. It was developed as a standard from studying how buildings actually work. And it's been optimized over the years using the evidence of monitoring. So that's, again, another reason why it really does actually work. So what is it? Well, essentially, you've got a good level of insulation. You've got uh, an airtight building, free of thermal bridges, uh, triple glazed windows, carefully orientated to ensure that you don't overheat with too much sun in summer, but you use the useful uh, warmth in winter. And then critically, a mechanical, a whole building ventilation system with heat recovery, which is constantly supplying pre-warmed fresh air and constantly extracting stale air. So overall, passive house guarantees that buildings will perform as designed. Uh, they uh, ensure reduction of energy by design rather than just offsetting carbon by adding on renewables. You can still add renewables, but you need less of them to offset the carbon that you get, reduce carbon that you're then using. Uh, with simpler systems of controls, it reduces maintenance and running costs, and overall it's offering a sort of robust way to meet uh, government sort of carbon uh, targets. Now, what's really critical uh, is that we've monitored this ourselves in schools built uh, over the last uh, 10 years. So I can share with you a little bit of the monitoring evidence, uh, which leads into how uh, it can help assist uh, with uh, minimizing the risk of, uh, of COVID. So we undertook a study where we uh, monitored over a year um, a, a conventional 1970 school uh, and various uh, different factors. So I'm going to show you here first of all thermal conditions in winter and you can see uh, this building is pretty chilly, uh, very cold in the morning, hardly rising to the level it needs to be uh, and the reason for that is it's fully insulated but also it's relying on uh, sort of natural background ventilation, only windows to get sufficient uh, air quality. Uh, this then is a more traditional uh, sort of recently built building built to Briam and building red standards. As you can see that the temperatures are higher but only just getting up to the level and sometimes peaking a bit uh, high perhaps. Uh, but starting often at the beginning of the school day, sort of uh, you know below comfort levels and just rising during uh, during the morning. Uh, by contrast, uh, this is uh, in blue here, the second of our generation passive house schools. You can see it's always up at level it should be, uh, and staying within a sort of couple of degrees of that uh, throughout the school day. In uh, summer, where people might worry that uh, passive house would overheat, this is the conventional building. Uh, this is the Brian building and then this blue line here is the passive house building. So you can see that it's actually uh, tracking a, a sort of a comfortable temperature and keeping it cooler than the conventional uh, uh, buildings have done. But then the most critical one really in terms of uh, context of COVID is air quality. Uh, so this is the conventional building uh, measure showing CO2 levels in parts per million. And really you should be under 1500 averaging uh, around a thousand. You can see here particularly in winter, but also in autumn, it's peaking way, way above that, so there's three, four, five thousand parts per million. In the Building Reds uh, building, uh, particularly in winter, it's again peaking far too high at three to four and a half thousand parts per million. By really significant contrast, this is the same uh, monitoring week in our uh, Pacifas school, just down the road from that school, and you can see uh, in all seasons, right down, never getting up to 1,500 and averaging well below a thousand. Million. So that's a sort of really good demonstration of the air quality improvement you get uh, with passive house. So why is that important in the context of COVID? Well, it's, it's well established now that the virus can be spread via aerosols in the air, which are generated by people breathing. And those will stay in and around the air unless they're diluted with uh, adequate uh, ventilation. So if you've got somebody who's infected, they will be breathing out aerosol and it will be there for other people to breathe in and catch the infection. And you know, recent medical research into the uh, virus contamination is showing a sort of a very strong correlation between uh, levels of aerosols in the air and uh, the, the measured CO2 levels. And the recommendation is that CO2 concentrations should be kept below a thousand parts per million at all times to reduce uh, the risk of infection in the room. Uh, and the recommendation is that adequate ventilation is required to do that. The question really is, is how. 
So it could be through natural ventilation and uh, often in an existing building that is the only option, but that can obviously lead to serious uh, discomfort in, in winter. Uh, if you've got windows wide open to, to maintain a good ventilation levels, then the heating system will never be able to overcome that, particularly sort of in, in winter conditions. Um, and the graph I showed you before sort of reinforces that. That's why they rise so high in winter, because people don't open the, the windows normally. And if you do open the windows to get those levels down, you'll get that sort of serious uh, temperature reduction and discomfort. So the, the option that what Passive House delivers with its mechanical ventilation and heat recovery is a constant supply of fresh air to occupied spaces and a constant extract of stale air um, with continuous heat recovery, which uses extracts of heat from the outgoing air to warm the, the incoming fresh air. So it just emphasizes no mixing of that air and there's no recirculation of that air through the system. Um, and one of the things I always uh, uh, sort of say is that people talk about natural ventilation and it sounds lovely and cosy, but if you actually called it or what it is, random uncontrolled ventilation, it sounds less attractive. Mechanical ventilation doesn't sound that attractive, but if you talk about it as a constant supply of pre-warmed fresh air, it starts to sound much more attractive, which is actually what it is. So I think uh, terminology is quite uh, revealing. Uh, and as I showed you with that graph, with that mechanical ventilation, you get the CO2 levels right down to the levels they need to be um, to, uh, as far as is possible, minimise the risk of infection through aerosol uh, transfer in the air. Obviously, there's no, it doesn't eliminate it, but it dramatically reduces it. Uh, and that's what we, all we can do to, to minimise risk really. So uh, pass pass ventilation rate is generally about 20 cubic metres per hour per person. Um, but obviously with the MBHR, you can actually increase that to 30 or, or more even by just adjusting the MBHR unit uh, during periods of high uh, risk uh, during the pandemic without having a significant impact on comfort levels. And if you need to, you can always open the windows too. So that is really the sort of main message I want to get over, but does this all cost more to do? Well, if you're building a new building to Passive House, there are some extra costs. You've got more insulation and higher performance windows, and you're achieving higher standards of air tightness, and you do need to provide an MVHR. So there are potentially some extra costs. There are some reduced costs. You'll end up with a smaller heating system and simplified controls. It encourages a more rationalized building form, and you've got reduced reliance on more expensive uh, renewables. And there are some nil costs, just designing less complex, several bridge free details, won't cost any more. Uh, and uh, Passive House really does encourage sort of better collaboration across the teams, which doesn't cost anything either. So overall, <coughs> I apply my own rule of cost estimating that if you start out on a project because it's Passive House and it's going to cost five or 10% more, then it will because everyone adjusts to that in the back of their minds and they'll spend it on something. <coughs> it may not even be Passive House features, it might be a nice cladding or some other feature. But if you see price as a priority and Passive House is just as one for many standards you have to achieve, then it will <coughs> cause you and, and encourage you to make sort of uh, sensible balances of, of where you spend a budget in order to achieve a higher quality standard. <coughs> so how do we do that? Well, first of all, when we're designing, we really need to respond to the orientation, optimise the building in relation to solar gain and shading and really simplify the form. The more external wall area you're building <coughs> for the useful internal area, the more it's going to cost you and the more heat you're going to use through it. Then we're really focused on rationalising the glazing to optimise daylighting and ventilation whilst minimising the overall cost of it, so keep it simple and just making it work exactly right. And then you're looking at simplifying the detailing to make it easier to be airtight and thermal bridge free and more economic uh, to build. And then with the building doing all the hard work to save energy, you can dramatically reduce and simplify the services and controls so on the left-hand side, you can see four modular boilers, typical of the size, heating an entire secondary school. And then in the middle, uh, one of those boilers is sufficient to heat an entire passive secondary school. The other is just a, a backup. And then in each classroom, you have a one tiny radiator. So a really dramatically reduced level of services and the controls required to actually uh, to, to operate it. And uh, just a few photographs to sort of demonstrate uh, that all of this approach to simplification really doesn't uh, mean any compromised architectural quality to creating light, airy, well daylit spaces. <laughs> all these projects were built within standard schools' budgets, 
this is one of the first pacifier schools in the UK that we did um, about 10 or 11 years ago now. Uh, this was the second generation of the same like authority where we reduced, uh, there, was a, there was a reduced budget, but having monitored and uh, learned lessons from the first building, we were able to optimize and reduce costs on the second one and to actually deliver a really good quality passive house building um, uh, within that reduced budget. And then this is our sort of most recent uh, finished passive house school building. This is actually the first secondary school to passive house in the UK, uh, built in the Borough of Sutton. Um, and uh, this is the one that's heated, the entire building is heated by that one domestic, large domestic size uh, gas uh, boiler. And uh, you can see there on the left hand side, uh, the solar breeze soleil shading to uh, keep the sun shaded out uh, during the sort of uh, higher periods of sun, hot, hot sun in, in, in summer. And a couple of pictures internally to show the sort of quality of the spaces and the finishes and the light that you're, we're, we're achieving within these uh, asset house schools. Uh, and then this is the Enterprise Centre at the University of East Anglia, um, <coughs> which has achieved a DEC A energy performance rating four years in a row, and again has had incredibly good feedback uh, doing user occupant surveys, uh, focusing on things like the good levels of air quality uh, that people experience uh, in, in the building. But the challenge is really in achieving this uh, sort of simplicity of design is that when it comes down to it, architects do like complexity and they're always, uh, well, they tend to uh, develop uh, complicated forms and shapes, uh, interesting buildings perhaps, but this really would be a challenge uh, to, to make passive house, thermal bridge free, airtight, and it's sort of over complex buildings that are then really tricky uh, to operate and will cost more to run uh, and uh, have experience that performance gap. And then the other big challenge really is m engineers also like complexity, they like their pipes and wires, uh, and you end up potentially spending uh, a lot of money uh, building and maintaining complicated systems. But be, to be fair to the engineers, they're often needing complicated systems to sort of overcome the problems that the architects designed in. And really everybody needs to work together to optimize the building, the forms, systems, all working uh, together uh, in a sensible way. So just to sum up, uh, in the past, buildings used to be really rather simple um, in how they were built and operated, but they're obviously highly energy consuming and often uncomfortable and certainly unsustainable uh, in the long term. In the present world, we've sort of moved towards very, very complex solutions, uh, achieving carbon targets with lots of extra technology to offset and generate uh, uh, energy to offset the carbon that perhaps we really shouldn't be using in the first place. Uh, and with the performance gap, uh, often resulting in buildings which are actually uncomfortable and using more energy, emitting more carbon than they should, and therefore in the long term, I would argue, rather unsustainable. What Passive House does is offers a much simpler approach. We're focused on getting the building right, which we know from monitoring uh, is energy saving. We know from monitoring is comfortable and therefore sustainable. But I think critically in the context of this seminar, as I've hopefully sort of just briefly demonstrated and highlighted, um, by having this approach focused on uh, people's comfort and well-being in the building, we're actually doing as much as we sensibly can to minimise uh, the risk of COVID infection without compromising uh, the energy performance and of the building and the comfort of the occupants uh, within that. So thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to uh, discussing any aspects of that uh, with you. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. I'm sure I'm not the only person who found that enlightening because I think I had that erroneous view that uh, passive house meant a rather tight building and maybe that was actually going to be a problem in the time of COVID. So it's absolutely fascinating to see you producing stats and figures saying actually these are the safest buildings that we can have. We've got lots of questions that have come in. Um, just before we move on to the questions though, I have got um, a little announcement of another event. Um, and this is an invitation in fact to all of you uh, from Shuko uh, to join Shuko as they launch Innovation Now or iNow, which is a dramatic online format to introduce their latest product and innovations. 
and the launch event for iNow will take place at 10.30 uh, on Wednesday the 24th of March. And for more information uh, and to register, uh, there's a website to go to, which is www.shuco, which is spelled S-C-H-U-E-C-O dot com forward slash UK forward slash I now spelt letter I-N-O-W. Uh, but there will be a link to that um, at the post information uh, that you get sent afterwards. Um, and I'm going to start with a question which I think I'll put, uh, has come in, which I'll put first to Jonathan and then to Hugh, uh, which is about working with existing buildings. Um, you know, we've seen, on the one hand, we've seen Hugh's sort of great ideas for this 3D printing, etc. Uh, and we've seen Jonathan talking about how you create uh, a passive house school. Uh, what can you actually do with existing buildings to get to where you want to be? Uh, Jonathan, I'll put that to you first. Okay, thanks, uh, Ruth. So uh, I personally think uh, the government should be doing is actually looking at uh, a significant retrofit of existing schools around the country. Uh, the sh actually, you know, it would be beneficial, I think, to look at how existing schools ventilation could be improved. Uh, either by retrofitting an MBHR system uh, across the school or localised units within classrooms. At the moment, the advice seems to be basically open windows, which will be okay now, potentially spring and summer, but uh, in winter, that you know, cold weather is, is not going to be an issue. So, uh, yeah, that's what but I, I, I feel that schools can do what they can to improve the ventilation where they are able to by opening windows on the weather, but I really feel that we should be looking at a nationwide sort of uh, technical accessible stock and looking at how we can properly improve ventilation. I think ventilation, the new good ventilation is going to be here to stay uh, beyond the immediate pandemic and it's uh, it's good for people's concentration and well-being anyway. It makes people safer uh, in, in risk periods. So I, I think it's something that should be addressed at a national scale. Truth. Um, I'll just pick up and take over for a few moments whilst we try to reconnect Ruth and bring that question as she was fully intending to do uh, to you Hugh. Um, what, what's, your, what's your take? Yeah I think that working with existing buildings is absolutely critical um, and I sort of in my presentation showed an image of a retrofitted school. I think the availability of funds to um, overhaul schooling has been shown to be in short supply. You know, we've got buildings that aren't fit for purpose. I think if we're also talking about bringing new technology, we've got to be able to do that in a way that's lighter touch than than um, building, you know, all of our uh, infrastructure, our school stock back from, from scratch. So certainly yeah, retrofitting will be, will be crucial. And I think it's possible. I mean, I, I think that what I was trying to tap into was that things like uh, projectors, cameras and microphones are a technology that does already exist in schools that we can use for to create these sort of virtual experiences that I've been describing. So um, definitely think that that will be an important part of the strategy. Thank you. Um, I shall press on because we've, uh, we'll try and get Ruth back um, to, to complete. Uh, but in the meantime, there are a, an abundance of questions to get through. Let's, let's bring you in, Diana, because there's a question here that says, do you find that all these metrics result in different results uh, if you used common sense and instinctive design? In other words, can you measure what you're doing differently? Uh, I think a lot of the sort of the ideas in our um, five ways to wellbeing are instinctive and what a lot of architects would do naturally. But actually, sometimes when you're looking at a project, being able to demonstrate the real value of those ideas so that it, um, it doesn't, you know, the cost consultant or the client doesn't think you're sort of putting in frivolous um, aspects into the design, that they actually have a meaningful output um, is really valuable. And actually being able to measure that and measure the metrics to be able to demonstrate that to some clients is really valuable um, rather than it just being purely instinctive. Smashing. I think we can bring Ruth back in now. We've got. <laughs> Thanks for that, Diana. And there was a question as well about how you conducted your research and what sample size you used. 
So the initial research actually was with um, independent schools. Uh, we do quite a lot of independent school work around the country and we sent out a survey through ISPA um, to all their bursars that they work with. Um, I think we had about 100 responses from bursars around the country. Um, and then we also talked to the secondary schools that we're working with. So not a massive sample, but um, I think probably enough to back up some of the instinctive sort of natural um, way we approach design. Thank you. And and Hugh, um, a question which says, uh, you speak of using technology as a platform to connect outside the realm of the classroom. Um, and has this agenda been tested in actual classrooms? And a second question, which I think may be related is we've got someone talking about um, Australia and saying that um, Australian schools and universities already uh, work in smaller groups with peer learning and why is the UK being so hesitant to follow this proven example? Great okay well I'll um yeah so two questions I'll start with the with the first has this been tried and tested in classrooms? Well, I mean, I sort of argue that um, we're, we're trying and testing it now in a way. Um, we're not in classrooms per se, we're, we're at home um, mm -hmm. and we're all connecting into a virtual learning space that isn't in a school. I mean, who knows where it is, it's sort of in the cloud, isn't it? Um, I think that there's a distinction um, that I'd like to perhaps draw between uh, what we describe this as is distance learning and uh, distant learning. And I, I describe it as distant learning because I think it's got all the sort of bad parts of, of the technology and Zoom that I sort of alluded to in the presentation. Um, but I don't think it's truly distance learning like I'm describing and like the question sort of touches that with linking outside of the classroom realm, perhaps linking with other classrooms, with other school and other children, because you're still, we're learning with the children that you would have, or the students that you would have shared your physical classroom with. So it didn't really exploit the true benefits, potential, or even try to connect people at distance and transcend the catchment area. So I think in a way I'd say that we're proving that we can link with learners in different places. We can successfully teach with learners that aren't in the same mm -hmm. room, but we're yet to really explore the kind of potential of linking outside of the realm of the classroom and outside of the realm of the catchment area. So that would be my sort of um, response to that first part. And in the in reference to the sort of the, the second question that about Australia and about um, these ideas being tried um, and and tested in other other cultures and other nations, uh, I don't know an awful lot about Australia. I'd say that. Um, it is being tried increasingly in the UK. Um, and I, I spoke about the Hertzberg as articulated classrooms mm -hmm. and how that could allow for small breakout groups. And there has been a, a pioneering primary school, the University of Cambridge Primary School, that does have classrooms that step a little bit like Hertzberg as plans. And they're sort of looking at breakout spaces. Um, and certainly at higher education, there's lots of emphasis on pods and, 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 and people being able to work in smaller units. Um, I think that while there's been a sort of a, a, a drive towards starting to engage with those ideas, we're yet to really try them, perhaps in the UK for a variety of reasons. One, our classroom spaces, as I alluded to, are very rigidly set up for those kind of 30 mm -hmm. person style of, of, of teaching, um, which perhaps inherently suggests a way of doing things. It means that we've not really tried other ways of doing things. Um, and I also think there's perhaps a, coming back to my first answer about resources, and that was about building costs and trying to rebuild building stock, but there's also something about staff ratios and the, 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 amount, the amount of basically staff time that we have to dedicate to children. And obviously if you split groups up, they require a teacher for each of those small groups or input in order to, into all of those small groups, which becomes quite difficult to deliver. And that's why I think that using connective technology to allow for smaller groups in schools that are perhaps based along lines of compatibility, separating them from other students that are in their local area that they might not learn so well with, but linking them with other compatible groups in other schools is great because it reassembles units of 30 students, which means that you can have one teacher for those 30 students and you can keep the kind of staff student ratio the same, even though you're right. delivering more of a personalized learning. So I think 
it requires the technology perhaps which is why we've not tried it and i think it requires a change to the space and the architecture which we don't have at the moment and need to try and that's perhaps why we've not seen that the those shifts and that that uptake just yet can i just jump in and add yeah. uh, to, to that in terms of uh different ways of teaching and learning uh, people talk about uk as if it's a single entity but actually education is a devolved matter and I've been fascinated uh, over the last few years since I uh, set up in, in Scotland and we are designing now a whole range of primary secondary schools uh, under the Scottish uh, system and it is completely different. There's a, uh, there's a massive focus on innovative pedagogy, on flexible teaching and learning, on a whole variety of different things. So for example, we're doing a new primary school for Citadel where instead of classrooms we've got uh, uh, three form year groups in one shared space with different zones uh, linking inside to outside and a big emphasis on outdoor learners using indoor spaces uh, that there is a, a right across the Scottish estate there's a, there's a huge emphasis on uh, radical and different ways of teaching and learning and I think uh, whereas in England it's become restricted to very very rigid classroom based uh, teaching and learning uh, and very very low budget building so I think it's really important to appreciate that there are some really exciting examples of Really, education happening right now on the ground in Scotland in buildings built over the last few years and currently being developed and designed and built going into the future. So, uh, yeah, it, the UK is not a single entity in terms of education. There's some very, very different and radical approaches going on here in Scotland. That's really interesting. Thank you. And it actually kind of ties in with a comment we had sent in, which said, all of these ideas look ideal, but it will all depend probably on a government who will be prepared for the initial outlay versus future cost savings. I think that's um, more of a comment than a question. Um, but I will, I have a few questions which I think are really for Jonathan, um, although if anyone else wants to chip in, feel free. Um, and I'll, I'll ask them all to you and let you come back with your answer. So. One of them is, what is the energy cost and unit price for heat recovery on mechanical ventilation compared with the heat loss cost with window opening? I think I get that. And then someone else said, it's a great section on the increased importance of the specification of efficient MVHR systems in the COVID era. Have you seen a recognition of this in your client base? I think maybe Diana will have something to say on that as well. And also someone says, People open windows, even if that means air pollutants or changes in the indoor temperature. How do you balance that in passive house design? Okay, so just in terms of uh, the energy cost of the balance, um, obviously if you open window, you, you're, you're not using any energy to open the window, but you're losing instantly all of the heat because it's cooling down the space very rapidly. So for zero energy, you lose a lot of heat. In MVHR, you're using a very small amount of energy to power the fans, but you're recovering 80 to 90% of the heat that would otherwise be lost through ventilation. So there's a massive uh, energy and cost benefit to MVHR as opposed to uh, opening window ventilation. Uh, it's pr been proven uh, time and time again. Uh, it really, really does work. Uh, it, given that by having a passive house building in MVHR, you're actually reducing the heat requirement in the building by as much as 90%. So you can move from on a secondary school four massive boilers to one domestic size gas boiler. And that's because the MHR is doing a huge amount of the work for very, very little energy. Uh, in terms of MVHR spec and clients, I mean, we're finding now almost every single uh, education client, well, in Scotland, every single education client now is focused on uh, quality of environment and energy saving. And uh, there's a big, big push for uh, uh, sort of doing ventilation properly. The BB101 uh, across the whole of the UK is driving that too, but we're seeing a sub understanding uh, in the rest of the uh, UK. Um, and the third question, of course, if people in a passive house building feel the need to open a window or want to open the window, that's perfectly allowed and people will do that. But we tend to find, and from our monitoring, we find that in traditional buildings, People tend not to when it's cold, so you get poor air quality in a passive house building because you feel comfortable with constant fresh air. You tend not to open the window unless uh, it's warm weather and you want to get a bit of extra fresh air in. It really isn't something that people feel the, that they need to do. But if they do so and you get a bit of extra pollution in from outside, that's kind of your choice. But we're actually doing a uh, passive house building on the most sort of polluted urban site in the London Docklands for a new school. and. Uh, you know, it's the only way you can guarantee that you'll get good quality fresh air 
is by not relying on natural relation, but actually using proper mechanical systems. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've got some more questions um, that relate to Hugh. You know, I know that Jonathan was talking about simplified forms needed to make passive work, passive housework properly. Um, I don't know how that relates to the 3D printed forms that you say you want to create, which are certainly anything but simple. And uh, as a rider to that, someone's also asked about, um, you know, you say it's very environmental doing printing with um, earth. And someone's asking about what the embodied energy is in, in that and whether you've got measurements of it. Q. Yeah, they're... Um... Great questions. Um, let's have a great so, answer. Yeah, let's hope so. Well, I'm not on mute this time, which is a good start. So, um, no, I think uh, in terms of simplicity versus complexity, I think it it's it is about a balance. Um, I mean, I spoke about these articulated plans with the range of scales, and they are more complex, and that does make modelling and and you know fixtures and and creating the sort of environments that perform really well more difficult. I think that, and I think Jonathan sort of has touched on some of those things really well. I think moving on to Diana, I think that there's another kind of side to that, which is that those complex forms, a lot of the complexity is the curves that, that I've been sort of starting to look at in some of the designs that I showed you um, and the curves that 3D printing is very good at delivering. And yes, they might be more complex and that might come with, with difficulties in construction, but those curve forms, as Diana says, sort of have a quality to them that is uh, attractive for learning environments and that you know, although that we might have environmental issues psychologically they come with uh, huge potential and huge benefits and you know they invite people to move around spaces to interact more and if this is an education is all about connecting then that's got to be absolutely crucial in terms of touching more specifically on on the environmental matters and on embodied carbon um, the 3d printing experiments that I was alluding to in Italy are, um, are very new uh, I think that they have done a test house a show house in a way but this hasn't been used for Finnish and inhabited buildings so I don't, that kind of data is not yet available from from the architects and from the the engineers involved in the project but certainly I couldn't see a reason. I think there are some additional binders they put in, but by and large, we're talking about a, a earth material, which there is data on. And, you know, I, I'm going to struggle to get the, the stats exactly right, but I think there's a, you know, a sort of 0 0.3 megajoules per meter cubed on rammed earth. And then you've got eight times that, nine times that on, on concrete, depending on what mix you're using. So I imagine that, you know, even if you're putting in more binders, maybe more stabilization, you could still be looking at a six fold improvement on the embodied energy of that material. Um, and like I said, I think it's got other benefits again, like psychologically earth, you know, the warmth and, and, and wholesomeness of that and tapping into a sustainable looking building for a sustainable vision of education that's going to prepare us for the future, hugely important. Um, so, and, and of course the, the range of colors and, and possibilities for identity. So I think it's certainly a promising future, but yeah, more research is needed, more information is needed and we look forward to that becoming available. Thank Ruth, you. can I chip in there? Yeah, absolutely, please. Um, just, in many ways of life, it's all about getting a balance, isn't it? And where um, the passive house and, and making sure that the envelope is very simple doesn't necessarily mean that the architecture still can't be enriching and, and have sufficient detail to really still, you know, give an inspiring and enriched environment in which to learn. I don't think, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. Absolutely. I um, agree with that. And I, would also, I would also add that I think the uh, use point about uh, natural materials uh, in uh, education environments is really important too. I think that sort of combination of uh, good comfort uh, and good air quality is really enhanced by making sure that using uh, uh, timber and other natural materials that are not going to be outgassing VOCs that you get. You know, so natural line instead of vinyl flooring and uh, timber finishes out of plastic handrails and you know you can actually build up uh, a really rich uh, stimulating healthy environment by combining uh, all the elements of what we were talking about today. Thank you I mean, I think it's really interesting I mean and I really stand corrected by Jonathan saying well when we talk about the UK actually what you're talking about is English experience because Scotland is far is way ahead anyway but I I just think I put to all of you that um, that obviously there's a lot of interesting thinking going on there's a lot of pressure to do it and some of you at least are you some of you at least are managing to achieve this in 
certain places. I mean, it's interesting, Diana, that you said you were doing your research in private schools. Um, and I just wonder within the state system for all of you, you know, we're talking about well-being. Uh, we're obviously talking about sustainability and the environment. Um, and we're talking about new ideas in how we teach. And how much do you think the environment in terms of the regulatory system, et cetera, is actually favorable to do this within certainly the state system? Okay. You've got the ideas, can you realize them in more than just a few places? And I think I'll go to Diana first. Uh, I think absolutely. It's about being really creative with the budgets that you have, the financial budgets and the space budgets, um, because you're all ultimately you're trying to deliver the same outcome, a great learning experience for um, for those schools. And actually, the independent sector is not so very different. They're still, you know, have cost constraints um, and a customer base that they're trying to uh, persuade that, you know, that their school is where they should be sending their children to. So the, the the reason we sort of did the research with ISBA in the first place was because I think a lot of um, parents, a lot of schools were seeing that parents were looking for something more than just great exam results. They were looking for an environment and a school that supported well-being. And it was really about being able to demonstrate to those schools that this not only had an educational benefit, but it was actually a, a good uh, good for their business as well. So I think it overlaps in both sectors, but I think perhaps independent schools just need a little bit more persuading of the of the value of it. Just my, my experience is that within the current uh, English uh, system for funding schools, it's incredibly restricted. It's pared down to the very, very, very tight space schedules of pedagogy based on uh, um, on corridors and classrooms and very, very low budgets, all procured through a centrally controlled contractor led system. And however hard you try, we have tried, I can assure you, it's really hard to carve out anything innovative within that system. Uh, and you know, the Welsh system is much more open, uh, the Scottish system definitely is very, very difficult. Uh, and so, you know, as I've already uh, spoken about this, the pedagogical vision uh, in Scotland, but just to give you an example in terms of the uh, environmental impetus, it's now a requirement in Scotland for local authorities doing new school buildings and getting funding for the Scottish Government to actually meet a specific energy consumption for the entire building for occupied hours year on year for 20 years into the future in order to receive their full capital funding towards that project. So the Scottish Government is actually driving all local authorities to respond, otherwise they don't get much funding for their schools if they fail to meet that energy metric, which by the way is not quite but close to uh, the pass -pass standard. So I think the regulatory uh, framework uh, can drive huge innovation and change, uh, but sad to say at the moment, I think there, there are some, I'm not saying there aren't examples within England, of course, there are some good examples, but it's much, much harder currently to do something really innovative, either in terms of uh, pedagogy or in terms of environmental uh, at the moment due to the, the, the way the whole system is structured. And Hugh, I mean, you really are talking about doing things in different ways. And I wonder how receptive uh, you're finding the authorities. Well, I think um, Jonathan's, you know, sort of uh, very, very, very um, astute sort of summary of the the issues we have with framework systems is is bang on but i think that uh i am optimistic that things will change and i think that that change will be led uh from staff and from teachers and i think that a lot of that will come out of the last year and, and the enormous shifts that that's involved for everyone and particularly for education um and I think in terms of what I've spoken about, I think two things will probably come out of it that will be important. The first is uh, an increased familiarity uh, towards technology from staff and willingness to adopt ed tech as it's known. And, I you know, there's been an enormous um, sort of groundswell of feeling that actually, you know, we can do it and we can do it without even any training and suddenly last minute. I'm not advocating that that would be a sort of rollout plan, but it has yeah. been amazing to see what's been possible. Um, and so I think that, you know, uh, in a in a controlled way, if we, if we could integrate 
technology with the other great parts of school-based teaching and we can have time to really develop the software and hardware we're using properly i think everyone's excited about where that can lead and i think the other sort of aspect of this year that will lead to perhaps um, increasing um, pressure to change some of the systems that are holding education in the in the stasis that it is at the moment will be from the way that teaching itself has been conducted and talking about what you know or alluding back to to, to my presentation and, and group sizes i think that breakouts mm -hmm. and of course the great question about australia breakout teaching has become much more popular we've seen it work and actually it's become much more part of school culture in the last year than it ever has in the uk as we've been using breakout features on zoom and teams you know for students uh, in a very widespread fashion. And every teacher I think has enjoyed the possibility of being able to do that and break people into smaller groups that are mm -hmm. in contained spaces, I suppose. And actually I think they'll be looking for their classrooms to, to do the same. So I think that um, in the future, we might see a lot of, a lot of, um, of, of, of change and a, and a different kind of vision for schooling that hopefully will be picked up by those at the top. Thank you. Um... We're getting near to the end of our time and I just thought I'd just throw in a couple of questions which I don't think you're even going to answer just just to give a sense of what the concerns are you know one of these is how do you ensure these uh, value concepts are not the first items to be cost engineered out and I think in a way we can either not answer the question which I'm going to suggest or answer it in great great detail because in more general terms I think we certainly had Jonathan talking about how you could make your passive house school very affordable provided that uh, you didn't think it was going to cost more and you didn't put in a pretty extra. And we had Diana talking about ideas which I think are very um, achievable. And the other question we had that came in, um, which came in quite early, I think in response to uh, Diana's talk, and I just thought it was interesting that someone asked this question because we should remember how wide the issues are and that uh, when we care about uh, well-being, we want the architecture to be right, but we want other people, things to be right as well, was uh, we had a question saying, how does junk food in school children's diet, both at home and at school, impact mental health issues? Now, that's not something that the architecture can uh, solve, although obviously if you've got a nice dining room, that might help. Um, and I just think it's a reminder for us that, you know, these are huge questions and I think it's been fascinating to hear the three of you um, talking uh, about your different, but I hope complementary approaches. Um, it's been fabulous having everybody here in terms of the audience and sending in so many interesting questions, which is obviously the only way I can actually see what you're up to, but um, it's been great to have such an engaged audience. Um, so we are going to draw this to a close. As I said, there will be a link uh, to be able to watch this again uh, and that will include um, the web address for uh, the Shuko I now thing so I, I thank Shuko again for making this possible uh, for assisting with this um, and on behalf of architecture today um, thank you all very much for coming I know there will be a number more events uh, coming up in the next few months so keep an eye out for them because you know the fact that such great speakers are here is not a one-off and there will be great speakers on other subjects so thank you very much uh, I'll let you get back to your work whether it's designing schools or thinking about other types of buildings um, and I look forward to seeing you again thank you <laughs>